Has your network been breached? Cyber Reason can help you answer this question. Cyber Reason products hunt for threats within your network and eliminate them in real time. To Cyber Reason, real time means within seconds. Founded by former military hackers who don't play by the rules, they've built this experience into their platform. Harness ingenuity and imagination, not just code, to defeat attackers. Cyber Reason, disrupt the adversary and let the hunt begin. Signal Sciences is the industry's first web protection platform that works in any cloud, any container, any platform as a service, and any modern application architecture. The Signal Sciences web protection platform can be deployed in next generation WAF, RASP, or reverse proxy modes, giving customers ultimate flexibility and coverage. Protect your web applications with Signal Sciences web protection platform. Signal Sciences, protecting applications, connecting teams. For more information, check them out at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. The average time between being hacked and realizing you've been hacked is one year. Can you afford to let an intruder roam your network for that long? Can your company weather the fallout when this comes to light? Black Hills Information Security can find the bad guys in your network and train you to do it yourself. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a hunt teaming engagement can help you find a persistent threat in your network. The hump dance is your chance to do the hump. People say, yo, Humpty, you're really funny looking. That's all right, because I get things cooking. You stared, you glared, you're constantly trying to compare me, but you can't get near me. That was our, our karaoke. And the, Thank you for our producers for putting stuff in our... And the, and the sad part is, you didn't need the teleprompter for I, that. No, I don't need the teleprompter for that. If you look really hard on the internet, you can find multiple versions of me doing <laughs> the Humpty Dance in oh, we're not. Uh, karaoke. And at least one of those at Kimono's in Orlando. Yes. At the Swan and Dolphin. Puerto Ricans do the Humpty Hump. They do. Speaking and one time when I was doing karaoke, mm -hmm. there was someone who was Puerto Rican in the audience. Uh, anyway, Cyber Reason, uh, it has a webcast coming and, and up. And now we, they're likely homeless, so well, 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 Yeah, well, well that's, that's, yeah, we, we, we talked we'll, about we'll the get, beginning of the we'll show to the, help our fellow Puerto Ricans. Well, let's get the, do, the, do the announcements, then we'll segue into Puerto Rico. Yeah, so uh, yeah. Cyber Reason has a webcast um, here. Uh, Ross Rastici, uh, Paul Asador, oh, that's me, Joff Thire, discuss techniques used to turn threat data into usable Information securityweekly.com forward slash cyber reason. It's going to be a fantastic webcast. I tell you, if you haven't checked out our webcast program um, lately, or you're like, hey, you guys do webcast, we do. You have to register for them. And basically, uh, myself and other hosts on Security Weekly do like shenanigans and in a very entertaining manner present information about. Uh, the topic, and then mm -hmm. the sponsor presents really smart information about the topic. Uh, <laughs> is so uh, it, it's a really great uh, webinar series that we're doing, and we've really, uh, I'm really happy. How long have we been doing webcast, Larry? Oh like, God, uh, even we, we were doing that for White Hat World back in 2006. You and I have done webcast. For sponsor for vendors, right? Mm -hmm. Even before we did the podcast, we were on the webcast thing. So it was over thirteen mm -hmm. years, and we've been taking everything we've learned and finally gotten to a point where uh, I'm really super happy with our own webcast program and really mm -hmm. proud of the product that we produce. It took it took a long time to really to get there, and what we're the content we're producing for our sponsors is unbelievable today, um, and we've. Uh, been able to pull in uh, various hosts from Security Weekly to help us with our, our webcast program, so make sure you check that out. Securityweekly.com forward slash cyber reason. We talked about SANS HackFest, uh, Pentest HackFest, HackFest 7, so SANS.org forward slash HackFest 17. The discount code HackFest 17 saves you $300 off of your HackFest Summit, which is November 13th and the 14th. Make sure you check that out. Um, also, in our announcements, I wanted to talk about, uh, that's the end of the official announcements. I just wanted to talk about DerbyCon and, and what an awesome yeah. conference it was. it was. It's kind of interesting, just to give the listeners a little bit of insight into the Security Weekly organization. Uh, first of all, those of us host, Larry especially, uh, and all of the hosts, I mean, we've been going to conferences and talking about them on the show since day one. In fact, yep. we were at a conference when we recorded episode one. Yep, and it, that was uh, KatrinaCon. 
Yeah. Because it was supposed to be in New Orleans and yeah. last minute Speaking they had of to hurricanes, shift it to LA. Yeah. Yep. yep. And mm-hmm. so we've been to a lot of conferences and I hate to play favorites because everyone that puts on a conference puts in so much hard work into Agreed. that conference. They really do, yeah. And I don't want to I don't want to say it's the Excuse best, me. but I think in terms of providing value in multiple different areas in terms of entertainment and fun, conversation and learning and networking and just hitting in all of those different areas in an 11 out of 10, I would per, put DerbyCon in that, that category. And I'm not saying, and again, I hate to play favorites, but yep. in terms of all of the things that I look for in a conference and like hitting a Grand Slam in all those areas, DerbyCon for me is that is that conference. Agreed. And when earlier this year, I mean, essentially we rebooted, I left Tenable, I built a staff here at Security Weekly, we developed a plan, we uh, attended or will have attended uh, over a dozen <coughs> shows in 2017. Mm-hmm. I kind of knew in the back of my mind where the employees here at Security Weekly, like what they would think about what conferences are. Yep. And I, I asked them, like, what's your favorite conference? And unanimously, everyone was like, DerbyCon. And so if, that doesn't, if that's not a resounding endorsement for uh, the DerbyCon conference, uh, I don't know what is. Yeah. I, I, kinda, I had this joking conversation with Dave. I had this kind of, there was other people around. I, I said, you know, and I told him the whole story about how we've been to conferences and it's new staff and everything. And I said, our favorite conference is DEF CON. And he gave me a, a, a gesture that involves a, a middle finger. But I was joking with him, of course. Uh, and DerbyCon is, mm-hmm. is just wonderful. I we agree. all have our experiences. We all have our stories. We all have our, I think, uh, the, the value and the benefit we get from it mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. more than just have. It, it's awesome because it's similar to the mission we have in the show where we want to have fun and be entertaining but be informative and have other benefits right. as well. And DerbyCon embraces that and it's... You know, interesting, if you ask Dave, like, how, how did he start DerbyCon? He said, basically, I called in a favor to everyone that I knew and that I was friends with. Yep. And he looked at me and was like, yeah, you have, you're, you're one of those people. I'm right, like, same, yeah, same. dude, like, same. A, a lot of he, us, right? He, he, you, call, he, me, call, he, he called, called all of us personally. He yep. said, will and, you come speak at our first conference? And we're like, yeah. And he's like, can you be there at Security Weekly and, like, you know, sell T-shirts? I'm like, yeah. Mm-hmm. And we did that. And... Little did we know that how mutually beneficial that relationship was, yep. uh, and, and how, how awesome fun, it is. It, it, how much just fun it's been. The whole community experience. I I don't have anything I could like nitpick on for the conference. Anything because they, they'll and they'll ask you during the conference. Everything going okay? I'm like, you guys are awesome. Like yeah. I couldn't ask. For, we attend. On average, now at least a dozen shows yep. a year. I'm like, dude, like, like, like you're, you're fine. So, so we 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 sponsored, we sponsored at uh, Guardians. We sponsored the CTF, and we mm-hmm. we had a booth, and we talked to a bunch of great folks, and it was unbelievable. Um, we gave away the In Guardians themed keyboard, which is mm-hmm. which was killer. And is that one you built? Was the one that uh, mm-hmm. we built? Uh, I built. Uh, Galen designed. Um, Galen is Jimmy's son. Jim, Galen is Jimmy's son. My mm-hmm. intern. Yeah, no nepotism, but. Uh, Totally on his own qualifications, and it's it's. Oh no! And he showed that in his interview on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, just we had a great time, and like you talk about like that, it was uh, you know Alex Hammerstone. Love Alex. Uh, he comes over to the booth. Hey, how's it going? Anything he loves you need, Facebook. Any, anything you need. I like, love following him on Facebook. He's yeah. one of the reasons why. He's a troll. I follow Facebook. He's a troll, but he's an awesome troll. He's like the <laughs> nicest troll in the world. Yes, because he just loves Facebook. But he, and he, what you find when you meet him in person, he just loves everyone. Right, he really does. Right. And that said, I think Sky Dog's tr- still trying to get that oil stain out of his driveway. <laughs> <laughs> Some people, you know, get you that. know the, the thing. You know, if I'm going to chime in here quickly on DerbyCon, the thing that I loved about this year and also prior years, but it just felt like home. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah. just like. So, you know, and it always has, and it, it, and it, it yeah. did this year. And I, the reservations about next year, I think, <clears throat> uh, six out of the seven derby I missed last year, and I, yeah. I, I deeply regret that, uh, to be honest with you. Um, and I would trade any other conference or activity to, to have gone to, are you good? You had a good reason to miss it last year. I did, I did, it, even still, like the just the track record they have. Mm-hmm. 
to talk about the, when they're moving from uh, after seven years at the Hyatt, they're moving to a new venue. I, I really don't have many or really any reservations about that. I think it's going to be fantastic yeah. because of I, I'm the hoping that uh, – I don't know if they've thought through the logistics. I'm sure they have. But even though they're moving to a bigger venue, the, the Marriott that's right next door, yeah. I'm hoping – that they're going to still have an arrangement with the Hyatt for mm-hmm. a lot of the conference attendees to stay there. Mm. I have to think yeah. that you know, lobby slash lobby spill con. out into the driveway con yes. is yes. still going to happen yeah, at the that, Hyatt. Because that will not happen at the Hyatt. At the Marriott. You don't uh, think? Right, right, right. No, it will not happen at the Marriott because I've seen that. Yeah. I've seen that driveway, there, and it's it's not conducive no, to that not. type. Yeah, I just don't see. I don't see what happens out in the in the driveway of the Hyatt happening over at the Marriott. It's I mean, what a, what, a, what a Dave totally tells me vibe. is that uh, to speak to your point, Jeff, that they they sell out in three minutes when mm-hmm. <laughs> they release tickets. It was about twenty three or twenty five hundred attendees yeah. at, at DerbyCon. They can mm-hmm. open that up and I think easily fill uh, both of those hotels. Um, and still provide that environment. I'm really hopeful yep. that they yep. they are going to do and, that. And so. that and that said, we Dave and crew and 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 everybody credits Dave with DerbyCon. It's not just Dave. It's that that whole it's the group. whole staff. It's the whole staff. They have worked with the Hyatt for so many years and seven had, years. And right. Had such a great relationship between the mm-hmm. attendees, the DerbyCon staff, and the hotel. The Hyatt stocks that, up on that, booze, dude, before we get there. The Hyatt is also our family. Yeah. Not not only do they stock up on booze, but if you, if you went by the bar, and I, I don't know the guy. I don't know if he's ever listened to our show, but one of the bartenders named Chase. I think mm-hmm. that's Chase, his name yeah. was. He seemed to be, like, on duty I don't think every, he, I don't think he ever took a break. I think he every time I walked by the bar, he was He was there. there. Morning, noon, or night, whatever day it was, I, I think he basically worked three days straight mm-hmm. at the bar. Yep, because you so know what? The, there's Cause, definitely cause the, some dedication. Because there. the first year he was, we were there, he was one of the biggest advocates to the management staff saying you needed more alcohol. And the second right. year, he was the biggest al- advocate saying you needed more alcohol. But I think it speaks and, to our community and, took, and the and DerbyCon attendees because. For him to say, I want to work that conference every year yes. speaks to how everyone is polite, respectful, spending money at the bar, mm-hmm. um, and just all those factors combined. Yep. Treat, He's treating like, look, the staff well. this is a crowd, they're very respectful, and they like to drink, and no one gets out of line, and it's just a win-win for everyone uh, at the conference. Mm-hmm. I do also want to say before we uh, transition that the Saturday night of uh, DerbyCon... Uh, we kind of made homes at the smoking area because we yep. like to smoke cigars. Joff, uh, Jeff, myself, and many others were there most nights uh, and, and during the day. We spent a lot of time smoking cigars, talking to people. And on Saturday night, there was an individual who came to our, uh, not our table, but the table we were at, you know, in the smoking area and plopped down a whole bunch of bottles of bourbon. Mm-hmm. One of them was a Basil Hayden's, like, newly was released. Was it the rye? I think dark. it was, was the it rye. Greenish, it was a dark was it rye. Greenish, was yeah. it a greenish bottle? Yep. That was, was the bottle I finished. I brought a bottle with me, and I finished that while we were there. He brought one of those bottles. He had a bottle of Blanton's, and he brought an entire box of Cuban cigars. They were H. Upman Magnum 46s. They were from Europe because I recognized the... Uh, packaging and labels they have to put on there for Europe for for smoking laws in Europe. It, whoever that is, please tell us who you who you are. Please, if anyone else can identify that person, mm-hmm. they we have, we have gifts to send you. We have gifts to send you because you embodied not only the spirit of the security community but the spirit of DerbyCon, the spirit of Security Weekly, in that you were completely selfless and shared bourbon and cigars with everyone in the effort of uh, promoting communication, friendship, and, and sharing in our industry. So uh, thank you for that, and we would yes. like to recognize you and, well, and, and send and you some the, stuff because I, I do of, thank you for that. There was a lot of bourbon. It might have actually been two different people that were po- offering mm-hmm. up cigars. The, I think the, the guy that had the box of Cubans – and the guy that had the the basil Aiden and the Blantons might have been two different guys, but yeah. we were drinking a lot, and we apologize. Whoever, yes. whoever, we whoever brought that basil Hayden's rye, <laughs> that was that's awesome. a lot. That's a lot of respect because that's a, not a necessarily cheap bottle of rye. 
and I it just was show, awesome. I, and it's very hard to come by. It's a limited release, and I showed awesome. Paul a case of that. And uh, it was the same person who had the H up I H up in Magnum forty sixes um, that are an awesome Cuban cigar. You uh, focused on the cigars. I focused on the bourbon. yeah. So whoever you were, please <laughs> identify yourself. I wanna, I wanna know, and don't, don't be, don't Four be tick. fake and say, hey, I was that, but no, like I wanna know who that person was. Yeah. Well, and and also the the hun- uh, well, maybe not hundreds, but the many many people that came around and said, hey, you're Joff, you're Paul, you're Larry, and introduced yourself and mm-hmm. said thanks for what you do, and mm-hmm. you know we. It could quite frankly just- be the. Um, most highly concentrated uh, collection of listeners to Security Weekly <clears throat> that attend DerbyCon, and mm-hmm. I do, Joff, agree with your sentiment. Thank you, everyone who Absolutely. came thanks. to our booth, who recognized all of us, yep. uh, and thanks us for what we do. Like, every, like, every, thank every, you. Every time I li- meet one of our listeners, oh, Larry, I've been listening for so long, and I say, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, like, thank and you and for thank listening, you. and thank, thank you, you for coming to DerbyCon and being yeah. part of our community. Like, that's, it, it, that's one of those conferences that and is I, truly special. And when, and when people approach me and tell me that you know they appreciate the show and thank you know they're they're, they're an avid listener, longtime listener, I apologize for Larry also. <laughs> awesome. So oh, uh, two hey. th- two things I wanted to call out about DerbyCon about that whole family and the, everything. There were there were two incidents that that come to mind for me, um, and, and one is the fact that he who shall not be named canceled on the Saturday mm-hmm. night party. Hear this. And you know what? F him. We all had a damn good, damn good time, anyways. Because damn we straight we we, did. we drank and ate all the food out of the green room, <laughs> and they they adapted. That's what we do. And we had a great time, and it was awesome. And Dave bought seven hundred and fifty shots of uh, uh, something, fireball, fireball at the bar. And you know what? We had a great time, even though the main act didn't show up. That's okay. I, we you rolled know, with it, and, I, and I, I, I don't think there was any person that was mad at DerbyCon because the the act didn't show up. Certainly not me or any of us, mm-hmm. as we have guests on our shows uh, every week. That, that so, some of them have things that come up, and some of them have to go hang with Exhibit. I but, um, can sympathize with the folks at DerbyCon that were on the absolutely. receiving end of that, and I actually did send them a personal mm-hmm. note and be like, "Dudes, look." I love everything you did. Yeah. I don't fault you at all. I know what you're going through. Like mm-hmm. I've been there. Mm-hmm. I've had people cancel. You got to roll with it. Um, and you, they did an amazing job. They did an amazing job. And everybody had a good time, regardless. Right. The second one so, is. And so the, what? The se- what happened? Did like Dual Core step up? Like what? Uh, Dual Core and his partner there. Mm-hmm. Um, I can never remember his name. Yeah, they stepped up. They filled an act. And, uh, so they just kept playing, basically. They just kept they, well, yeah, they, like they props were back, to they 80, 80 and, and whoever else. I, I, it, I, it, it's going to drive me nuts. Stand up, stand up, folks. Yeah, yeah they they filled in, and then uh, Dave said, I, "I don't know exactly what happened." C sixty four. So and uh, so they went over to uh, Third Street Dive, mm-hmm. and I don't know what happened over there, but I'm guessing that Dave had some involvement with picking up bar tab and stuff. Because they had extra budget. Because they, well, yeah. yeah. And yep. <clears throat> and everybody had a great time, and it was just, it was awesome. And LobbyCon was brilliant, even after that, even after the music shut down early. I did well. I didn't go to the music because I was at LobbyCon <laughs> like the entire I, time. Yep, I was I was at LobbyCon most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. In, in a <laughs> in a panda lobby. mask at one. T- yep. I don't yeah. understand <laughs> yeah, what was happening. Know, You're always know. in some kind of mask at yeah. DerbyCon, Joff. Yeah. I don't. The don't the, the other one that I wanted to highlight that happened. was that amazing things that come out of DerbyCon is. We talked about Puerto Rico a mm-hmm. little bit, and uh, you know Carlos and uh, Jose Canones was were there. Carlos was there teaching, and uh, the community rallied together behind yes our family from Puerto Rico to be able to bring power and communication back to some area, and they donated uh, forty. We got funds to initially, and it was discussion with uh, Josh Marpet and I about how we can do some communication. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, what about these? Um, what are the, about these radios? They're really cheap. Uh, we sent a bunch to Johnny. I have a bunch of them, and they can be reprogrammed, and they can do all sorts of great stuff. Uh, and they're like twelve dollars mm-hmm. for like FRS radios, which interesting. This goes to another story on the show. Um, they got like 40 radios with plans for 200 more mm. so that they can restore communication to fire and police 
and the community uh, in, in some of the areas and potentially make that even larger. And it's just amazing that we rallied together and we got tons of money to be able to support that. There were a lot of causes. Uh, hackersforcharity.org forward slash donate. There is a mm-hmm. donate button there mm-hmm. for Puerto Rico. I want to mention yep. that in this segment as well. Yep. We rallied for poor Trevor. Yep. And, and that was the, that's the amazing <laughs> one is that Trevor, some, something that was horrible, can't. something that was horrible and turned into a tragedy. It is. Which the hacker community <laughs> turned into something amazing. Uh, it was yeah, beautiful. Look, uh, I just, you pack, know, it, if so, up. here's the thing. Yeah. I, I really like Smash Burger. I've always been a big fan of Smash yeah. Burger. I love fried pickles and, and cheeseburgers. And I ate at Smash Burger as many of us did. In mm-hmm. fact, the. They're dirt, right across the street from the con. Across the street from the. And Dirty Little Secret, if you had to go to the bathroom and you were of a uh, male gender, they had a restroom that y- you could use as well, which is mm-hmm. one of the reasons why I ended up at Smash Burger. Because, well, and hopefully next year they'll fix this. It's always been a problem at DerbyCon is the smaller hotel, yep. only so, so many, many places restrooms. to go to the bathroom, yep. and most of the attendance is male, and so it, it gets tricky. So I ate at Smash Burger, and then Grifter, who's been on the show before mm-hmm. and a recent webcast, uh, found a cockroach in his milkshake. Yeah, my understanding was that it was a, you know, when you have a milkshake and you get that big chunk of ice cream at the bottom? Yeah. And sometimes you suck too hard, and you suck too hard, and... <laughs> And it was the cockroach at the back of his throat. And named it Trevor. Named it Trevor. And started posting on social media. And like, all more, of a sudden, more, it goes viral like Miami Herald, totally CSO Online. All of these people are supporting Trevor, who is a cockroach that was almost consumed by Grifter, yep. which is absolutely <laughs> and, hilarious. And, and, poor, and poor Trevor, uh, Grifter, you know, did the, hey, DerbyCon folks, by the way, there was a, there's a cockroach in my, in my, yeah. in my shake. And, um, uh, he died, and I'm going to name him Trevor. Right. And, and I don't, and, and you know what, though? I don't feel bad for Grifter. It's kind of karma because Grifter uh, iced me yeah, but, on but Saturday I, I, night. I, and yeah. so that's what you get. I mean, so there yeah. you go. There, there's some karma. Cockroach. I he hope, Grifter, you're listening because. Yeah. And so, so I think Josh yeah. wanted to say something. Oh, Josh, well, do you I, want to comment I, on the, the Trevor, just, uh, Trevor I, forget? Is that what the, the, the Trevor hashtag forget. Trevor forget? Well, Trevor Forget became a hashtag uh, on on the Twitters, um, and uh, there there became an entire uh, memorial for Trevor the yep. Roach Out, outside of it, the it, Smash Burger. Outside of Smash. Well, Burger. Smash Burger said, "Please just, stop," and people reminded Smash Burger of the Streisand effect, and so it was yep. just escalated. From there, this has nothing to do with security, and I really think we should move into security news. Well, well so here's here's where we tie it off. <laughs> this whole Streisand right effect right. turned Go into ahead. this whole thing that blew up, and people started. Oh, uh, No Starch Press did their Remember Trevor uh, Humble Bundle, which all of the donations for the Humble Bundle go to charity. And my understanding is that reached two thousand dollars to Puerto Rican uh, relief efforts. That's which is awesome. All I that mean, from like, a cockroach and a milkshake. That, so let me, that chase, we made fun let me of. say two things, and then we'll move on to the news. Please, um, quickly. Uh, <laughs> you know, on on the on, on the Trevor thing. Uh, you know, I was there for the whole Sunday night when the when the whole was it Sunday or Saturday? I Sunday forget. night. Mm-hmm. But the whole the whole memorial thing, and it was hilarious and it was fun. What was interesting was how our community can rally and 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 get things done even if it's just kind of a humorous thing um i i i hope that we can do as much if not more and just blow the doors off of trevor for things like puerto rican relief yeah i agree and things like that um i think we would be remiss and i don't know the details and i don't know any really what was going on but you know as great as derby con is and was and i and i i echo the sentiments that everybody said already it was it was not without some controversy there were some underpinnings of drama going on for lack of a better word and again i don't know the details but uh, i hope that um refer to your local twitter for more details and we'll leave it at that well you know it's out there but i i hope that our community, if if we really want to make a change in the world, make a change in the security world, make a difference, that we can, uh, you know, remember the way that we can bond together for stupid things like a cockroach, 
and and somehow apply that to what at least for many people is an important issue in terms of code of conduct code of conduct the treatment of people at the conference whether they're male or female whatever their uh, political persuasions are whatever whatever it is I, again i don't know the details i didn't really want to get into the details but yeah as much as we're going on and on about how great derbycon was um, I, I think we'd, we would be remiss if we would if we didn't say yeah and we have a few and we have a few words too that we're working on a, a, as a conference and as a community and I hope that we can band together as a community the way we did for a dead cockroach for some of the the larger I, more important I will issues. reiterate my sentiments that I made during my talk at DerbyCon and say that while a lot of uh, people who have issues whatever they may be, mm -hmm. whatever those are, that if you are taking to social media to air out those issues and create a so-called conversation, that that is not always the most productive way of doing that, that when we want to work out our differences and rally together for a cause or... Uh, have uh, a, an intelligent conversation about the issues in order to make things better, that those are best done in person-to-person -person communications, mm -hmm. that I will personally take on the task of being able to foster those communications. And if you have issues, if you have a viewpoint that differs from others in this industry, those are most always, in my experience, in 17 years in this industry, better worked out in person-to-person person -person communications. Mm -hmm. and, so and if we have different viewpoints, that's fine. Mm -hmm. We're going to have different Absolutely. viewpoints in this industry on multiple different fronts. Let's work those out. Mm -hmm. Let's let's come to some concessions. Let's make some uh, concessions let's a, on both let's, sides. Let's have a conversation. Uh, let's have a conversation. conversation outside of social media. Let's have a conversation. Yep. Let's work through those. Let's talk about because we're all intelligent people that have these viewpoints mm -hmm. that need to be expressed. There's let's, always more than one side to the story. Yeah, exactly. And we can have those in a much more intelligent form other than just poking each other on social media and creating mm -hmm. a shitstorm. Uh, I understand that uh, people have. Passion. Very passion. exactly passion. Uh, like passions and, and strong feelings. I, I think we can come to some common ground and, and make things better. And rather than just pointing at the problem, like we've done sometimes on some of these issues, let's work together to develop a solution to Jeff's mm -hmm. point about helping Puerto Rico and helping some of these larger issues in our industry. Let's do that in some more pointed conversations yep. uh, and, and really affect change rather than just ranting about things or talking about things. Mm -hmm. that, and, and, so and that was exactly what I said in my talk, and I'll just reiterate those sentiments yep. here on the show. So please, if you're in the situation where uh, – and some of it I think is you f people feel like I only have social media to be able to express my opinion Agreed. and reach the people who I need to talk to. You don't reach out to myself, reach out to us. We can help you foster those communications as best we can. I mean, sometimes we can't. Where we can, I can say, I will do that. I know the, the hosts and, and, and guests here in the show mm -hmm. can also Agreed. most likely do that as well. Uh, so just do that <clears throat> rather than just ranting about and not solving the problem. So, yep. and, and, and Case in point, to, to that comment, Paul, you and I have differing opinions on lots of things. Sure. And you know what? We converse like adults, and we either accept our we accept our differences. We come to an agreement, and we've what, been, and one we, of the things I love to point we've about, been doing that for thirteen years. Sitting but next one of the things I love to point you know, point out is that you know Marcus Random and I have had different viewpoints. He, absolutely, he's and been I'm on like, the dude, show and he's had dude, different viewpoints with what I, what we're talking about. The other about. thing I love is on especially Enterprise Security Weekly, mm -hmm. we'll say, "Hey, you know vendor X Y Z." I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't know what you're doing, what problems you're solving. And by the way, hey, if we get it wrong, like contact us. Let's get on a call and we'll mm -hmm. talk about it. And you know what? I've done that. And I've been not wrong, but we've come to some concessions to say the way it was presented was wrong. Mm -hmm. And here's how we actually help solve people's problems. And I'm like, holy crap, dude. Like you got it right. And they've come, come on, on the, the show, show, 
and they've gotten it right, and they convey that to our audience. Mm-hmm. And, and that's how we like to roll here at Security Weekly. Yep. And so whether it's your product, whether it's your political views, whether it's or your social commentary, whatever your issue is, we'll, we'll try to work it out. And we'll offend everybody equally. Sometimes we agree to disagree, but that's fine. Let's agree to disagree in a, in a public setting and have an intelligent conversation other than just 144 characters or just taking shots at people on social media, mm-hmm. which I don't agree. I, it sometimes, well, uh, on the flip side of that devil's advocate, sometimes it's fun, like we talked about Alex Hammerstone. Like, sometimes it's fun to kind of troll on social media yeah. and you know, present it. But don't let that, if it starts to escalate, let's have a more intelligent conversation. Yeah. With that, I would like to talk about some actual security news. Yes, let's do that. This week. And I want to lead in with the funniest story of the week to kind of get us started and get us a little lubed up for the stories this week. Because okay, we have a 55-gallon drum of lube right behind always, me. Because there's always time for lube. Always time for lube. And security There news. is a drug dealer who operated a dark website who was only convicted, beca- not convicted, I'm sorry, charged because that individual traveled from somewhere to Austin, Texas to participate in the U.S. World Beard Championship. And that is why... He was French. He was a French national. He was a French national who does have... If you look at the pictures, has an epic beard. So I so don't blame... I, th- I think I think. I don't Jack's blame him for wanting to compete. Jack, However... Jack's if, beard is better. Uh, true. However, if you uh, t- tend to operate the one of the world's largest underground... Uh, dark websites for illicit uh, traffic that is uh, they listed the substances that he was involved in. Let's put it this way. Uh, cocaine, LSD, methamphetamine, fentanyl, and oxycodone. Yep. Thank you, Larry. If you're doing that, oh. you probably <laughs> don't want to come to the U.S. Mm-hmm. and participate in a beard competition because they're going to you confiscate your busted. laptop. When they confiscated his laptop, they found uh, that... Half a, half a million dollars worth of Bitcoins and, uh, with a PGP encryption key entitled to OxyMonster. Which was his handle. And so, I mean, he faces life in prison for his charges. But that in, is an epic beard. It's an epic beard. But I yeah, mean, why but, would but you come be- to the... Don't, that, like, don't come... Was I mean, that beard worth a lifetime in prison? Apparently well, so. first of all, don't do things that are illegal. Like operate the. You got to You got to do what you got to do. Yep. If you're large enough to attract the attention of U.S. law enforcement in that light, you probably don't want to travel to the U.S. Fortunately, I think for law enforcement and the greater good of society, that person decided to travel to the U.S. and this illicit website is hopefully mm. taken down as a result. Very similar to, uh, I think, Silk Road. Totally different story. <coughs> Excuse me, what happened with Silk Road? But yeah, kind of interesting. What else we got, Paul? Yeah, a lot of stories, Larry. Yeah. Uh, but so once for you, Larry. Which one? There was once for you. Uh, backdoors in iPhone Seven. Broadcom has another vulnerability oh God, another in its one? Wi-Fi stack. I didn't stack. see this one. Yeah, it's bad. I saw. I saw the uh, the Bluetooth stuff. Bluebone. What's your blue, assessment blue, on Blue Bone? Blue Born. Blue, I thought it was Blue Bone. No, Blue Born. Because like Bluetooth is boning you. No, Blue Born. Blue As Born. So what he's uh, thinking about is Boner, man. I mean, it's Blue yep. Born. So Blue Born was uh, Thank you. Blue seven, born. seven uh, zero days against Bluetooth. Um, the six of the seven did not require any active att- uh, connection to any uh, Bluetooth devices. They were mostly passive. Um, one of them did was a, a, a Bluetooth pineapple. Mm-hmm. Which would man in the middle connections, uh, uh, unbelievable stuff. And to, to toot my own horn a little bit, and to toot Josh's horn as well, um, it, as one of the Bluetooth uh, classic labs that we do in the, the wireless course, we do some fuzzing against Bluetooth services, mm-hmm. uh, L2CAP and above, uh, which were many of where the issues were found for Blueborn. Mm-hmm. And uh, the students run. Uh, uh, a fuzzer against some Bluetooth stuff. And in just about every class, the folks that stuck around to do that Bluetooth fuzzing portion because it was optional mm-hmm. crashed their device in some way, shape, or form. So yeah. you kind of have it. It didn't surprise you. No, it didn't surprise me at all. But this was Wi Fi Broadcom no, chipsets no. Oh, that yeah, had that one, yours was, yes. Yeah. yeah. Another one. 
I didn't. I did not see this. This was passion iOS 11. A lot of stuff came out with iOS uh, 11. That's interesting. You know what else I discovered? Apple has a bug bounty program for iOS, but not macOS. Yeah, where were? That's that was the OS X keychain thing. The the iOS 10 keychain Patrick, thing. Patrick Wardle. Patrick Patrick Wardle, who yep. is a previous guest on uh, this show, this show, mm-hmm. I believe. A show. Um, in the Security Weekly Network. Who is the CEO and founder of Synac? Synac. Yep. Yep. Uh, which is a pen te- crowdsourced pen testing firm. Mm-hmm. Uh, discovered this uh, vulnerability. And really, one of the, the big takeaway from that story was that Apple basically has no bug bounty program for macOS. Yep. And basically uh, found that, like, uh, malicious uh, software can basically pull passwords from the keychain. I, I will share real quickly a, a recent experience with the bug money program. Um, I found a bug in Slack recently mm-hmm. and uh, reported it via their bug body program. Uh, allegedly, it was an information disclosure uh, bug, and um, it was worth $100. I could have cared less if I got $100 because I would have taken the $100 and uh, bought folks drinks at the bar at DerbyCon because I didn't care. Um, <coughs> but, um, when submitted, I thought it was fairly interesting in that it released the internal UID of the folks that were that tied to their Slack account. And I submitted it as an information disclosure bug to Slack and they came back and said, um, this is not a security vulnerability and, uh, we're not going to pay you for it. If you want, uh, to support general bugs, go here. And, uh, the next day it was fixed. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Yep. And, of course, I responded after they closed it. I responded, gee, you fixed it awfully fucking quick for not it being a security not bug. A security <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> uh, today, uh, I realized that taking out the username and password for a particular service on OS ten actually makes it work. <laughs> huh? Yeah. You uh, instructions for a particular device on our network um, had you creating a f- file sharing service. Oh yes, yes. That shares files. Yes. That does not require any authentication. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I was like, "Wow, that's kind of like a vulner feature vulnerability um, feature. feature. It's a feature. Feature oh, vulnerability. No. I'm not sure which. That's that's kind of bad." Oh. Alrighty. I like your story number. Uh, I, I it's like only the title. bad if it's exploited. Yeah, I Come like on. your the uh, title for story number four, Paul. Oh, so it, it's interesting. Uh, if you look back in the Security Weekly uh, history, we've talked about a lot of biometric yes. authentication. Yes. I think we've probably talked about cardiac. What do they call it? Cardiac scan yeah. authentication, yep. which basically um, picks up on a pattern of your heartbeat and uses that as your authentication. Now we talked about fingerprints, of course, Apple's facial recognition. We talked about retinal scans. We talked about fingerprints. We've talked about. Do you still have the RFID I implant do. in your? Do. Does it still work? Yep, still does. Right there. Yep. Where I can't find the video to that. I have it. I have it. Send it to we me. We should repost that. We got to do something with that. We repost that because the it, number is in the video and it's actually kind of interesting. So we uh, we built. I built a door in a box. It's a little Pelican case mm-hmm. type thing with some uh, hid and RFID readers that authenticates to a door controller and turns lights red or green whether you're valid or not, mm-hmm. so that you can practice using Proxmark and badge cloning. And the only tag that is programmed to allow access for the uh, RFID reader is this tag right here. Mm -hmm. And that tag ID is in the video. That tag ID is in the video. So a a listener is still listening In fact, I had to give my door in a box to one of our guys to do a demo. And we had to clone this tag uh, so that he had a tag that he could test it with because he couldn't take me with him. When I was was married, (coughs) we started in 05. I was married in 06. It had to be when I first moved into my house. It was. We decided probably in 06. Yep. It wasn't even 07. It was 06. 06 or 07. It was, win- it was winter time-ish. Larry had this idea in 2006 that said, hey, look, I want to video record us 
doing this segment and basically I'm going to surgically implant an RFID transmitter into my hand. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, I'm kind of creeped out about it. Larry brought all this medical equipment. It was like mm -hmm. gauze and uh, iodine and, and rubber gloves. Alcohol, and rubber yep, gloves. And yep. Like we all gloved up and Larry implanted an RFID chip in his hand. And somewhere we have the video for that. I have it. That we're hopefully going to post because we've seen so many stories about uh, people implanting RFID yep. chips in their hand. And I'm like, dude, we did that in like 06. Yep. And you know what? It's still a thing. Uh, a friend of mine uh, got RFID implants done in both hands in the same mm -hmm. spot. On both hands. Uh, last, Not the last year, but the year before at DEF CON at the biohacking village. It was like a really big needle. It was. Um, the, the, like a really like girth wise. Yeah, the diameter. The yes. diameter I mean, was I really so. big. Really because big. inside of that needle was the RFID uh, implant. It looked like a very very small pill. Yep. And I still and I still have a I still have the the uh, extras. The second, the extras. Like in case that didn't work out, we yep. could remove it and put another one <laughs> yep, in. I guess exactly exactly. And uh, I'm but I, no complications from that. None. It's been eleven years. Yeah, it's been right? eleven years. It's uh it. With some readers, it doesn't read nearly as well as it used to mm -hmm. because it's been encapsulated with um, one of the great barriers to RF energy. Water. Flesh. <laughs> Water. Yep. Flesh. Yep. So um, it's been encapsulated by so lots of... So does more flesh build up it on does, it over it time? Oh, no, okay. oh, a little bit. I mean, because mm -hmm. it's, it's a foreign body and the body wants to encapsulate it. And oh, so it builds up a little bit of scar tissue around it. And it's built up more scar tissue over time. And uh, Will it reject that over time? It could. Think? It could, but it, it hasn't. It's been perfectly fine. You never know. There's only a little teeny mark from where we did the entry. There's no for exit. Oh, I viv believe me. I vividly remember the entry. I vividly. And you probably more so <laughs> than anyone else on the planet remember yeah. that. And uh, uh, only a couple of times I've ever had any issue. Uh, one of the first times might be two years in, um, raking leaves in the yard. I was raking and I bumped it and it was sore for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And I think I had one other incident where it was maybe sore for a day or two, and that was that was it. Interesting. That was it. Yep. Interesting. Still there, still works. Tested it last week. And you, do you use it in your? I, ha I have not used it in quite some time. Uh, but uh, when I worked at the hospital, I replaced the door strike in my office, so I didn't have to use a key. You should use your Bloop. hand. Electronic strike, and I can open the door. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. And then Adam Laurie, yeah. and then Adam Lurie cloned it on stage to unlock my laptop at ShmooCon Two. Yeah. Yep. That's I remember awesome. that very vividly. Yeah. Yep. That would be ShmooCon Two. Yep. Wow. History. History yep. here on. And so that said, uh, this whole thing with the uh, the cardiac scan authentication, I think, me personally, I think using biometrics is a really bad idea. Why? You can't change it. Can't change it. I mean, you. we could rip out maybe on air your RFID chip and put a new one in your other yeah. hand. And if I were Can we do that? That would be fun. I, Let's I don't do know I, that. I don't know if yeah. I'd get this one removed, but I'd have this one put in. Um, we should do it again. I mean, it's tradition, Larry, and, that if you're going to put biometric, if you're going to put electronics mm, in your body, you do it on air. And I'd consider uh, using a, a T557 tag. Oh, do it. Do buy it. We'll... we'll, we'll Make a clean room or whatever we need to do. Somebody come I have it. some iodine wipes. It's fine. We have somebody to do it. But uh, <laughs> I, I'd consider something that would be re Who held the syringe? Was it It'll me? Or, fine. Was it, it me or Twitchy? It kind of oh. sounds it was, funny. It was I did the piercing and Twitchy did the the forceps. He did. Twi Twitchy held, the, held forceps the forceps. And he said he could feel both pops, one in, one out. It's kind of interesting. You had someone named Twitchy hold oh, the forceps. forceps. Where, and, and what could possibly go wrong? What was that? I think I was just providing the, the commentary. Cam camera and moral support. Moral support. I was just there for moral support. Yep. And you chose Twitchy. Someone whose na nickname I think, I think, was actually... I think he was the one that was least squicked by it, the whole thing. Because you were like, uh-uh, I ain't fucking doing that. It was, yeah, it was bad. It was hilarious. Because it, it, it was at the table in your dining room, in your uh, I'd be kitchen. better now. I've witnessed the birth of... Three children, children at this and, point, and, so I'm not really squeamish you, at all. You've witnessed the birth of three, three children and had multiple episodes with your um, uh, Roomba vacuuming up dog poop. Yeah, so I've seen a lot you're of good. Uh, poop. Uh, I've, had, yeah. I've had a uh, knee look, surgery in there as well, screws in my knee and the, stuff. Yeah, you didn't I'm, need the Roomba. Once I'm not squeamish now. Once you your children, you're never the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're good. You're good. <laughs> Speaking of children. 
Women says hacker spied on her through Bam. her baby monitor. Like we've been monitor. doing this for 13 years. <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes! That was seamless. <laughs> Finally busted. Oh. Oh. Well, it was in Australia. But here's what happened. Here's what happened, though. They noticed that their baby monitor from Uniden uh -huh. was tracking them as they walked in the room. And... It looked like there was like Chinese characters <laughs> inside of their monitoring, like two huge red flags that your baby monitor has been hacked. By the Chinese. But they brought it back to the store. My whole thing is you should bring it to people like us that can do forensics on it rather than bring it back to the store. Yeah, well, I mean, if you, the average consumer probably has no idea. Really bad. Yeah. I mean, this is a story we've covered before. Yep. Obviously. Yep. Uh, Iron Geek has been on the news for this type of stuff. Uh, I just think... Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to think. I think it's bad. Yep. Either way. I, I don't and that, know. And that's how you get that's pwned. deep. Paul, oh. Paul is uh, speechless. Oh, it's really bad. I am. I, I just don't know. Like, where do you go with this, right? Like, for your average consumer, what is your advice? Like... Welcome to the Internet of Shit. Like, don't, well, like, your advice could be don't buy baby monitors that allow internet connectivity. Even mm -hmm. that in and of itself could be confusing. Yeah. I mean, if you do, choose a good password. Well, but how, even how then. Do, how do I know it's on the internet? I have an app I can view it. Isn't it, like, right there? And my app, like, so my Arlo, you use Arlo, uh -huh. right? Oh, uh -huh. I just need my fingerprint. Yeah. To get into my oh, so it must be secure if it needs my bio back to our biometric conversation. It just needs my fingerprint to get yeah, access to it. No, yeah. no, no, I get it emails that I get emails that the camera door? triggered stuff. What? I get emails that it triggered stuff, and I click on the stuff in the email, and it logs me into the ROS site, and I view the video, and I'm like, where did I log in? Right. And you know what? I choose I'm, to ignore it. I'm still it. stuck on your fingerprint in your back door, but uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, you know, I was no hoping idea. I would have something really insightful for this story. Yeah, but by the time we got to talking about it on the show, but I really don't. No, no, no. Speaking of, uh, speaking I'm sorry of, to disappoint our listeners <laughs> on that, but like, I really don't. Speaking of, that's how you get pwned. Uh, my good friend John Sawyer turned me on to this one. Uh, oh, how is John? It, he's, he, good. He's, where, good. Where he's good. Where is awesome. he? What? Where is he now? What do you mean? Where is he now? Is he? Is he still work with? Oh he? yeah, he's in the Guardians. Oh okay. Like, where is he now? I know where he is on the planet right now. Oh, Florida. He's in Florida. <clears throat> so, amazingly enough, the uh, page that I linked to uh, is 404 now with the one of the world's most epic 404 pages at GitHub. Um, but the uh, the page linked to a dot .bash underscore history file. <coughs> for a That's awesome. For a specific user, uh, Zubiar. And in this dot .bash history file were all sorts of fun commands, including... Stuff that was linked to Equifax. I just... Wow. Even wow. better. Even better. I'm so glad you went there, Larry, because... Let's go uh, there. If I put my evil hat on, mm -hmm. Bash History oh is probably one of my most favorite files to oh look my at. God. So, uh, yes. so much so, I think in my career... So much so that you won uh, CCDC. Yeah, in my <laughs> career, like one of the most shining moments in my career solely hinges on Bash history. just sheerly the ability to know that Bash history exists. Mm -hmm. So we were in a CCDC competition. Yes. There was an RFID, uh, coincidentally enough, an RFID badge hacking uh, aspect that was in play for the competition. Mm -hmm. I was on the red team. And, the, and Larry the, was running control. There was a blue team. The vendor, the vendor left their laptop unattended. Right. So there was this like workstation where you could validate like or, or read and write badges and stuff. And like the entire hack that I did solely relied like on, on me history. being able to read bash like dot bash underscore mm -hmm. history. It is like the in terms of post exploitation or. Information gathering for an attacker, the like most treasure trove. So basically, mm -hmm. I cloned a badge. I went to Larry's workstation that he had set up to write a badge. Yep. And I looked at his bash history to see what 
like badges have been written number recently. and what badges have been read and read. And I, I wrote into a range based on badge history. I was then able to clone a badge as a red team member, clone a badge of a blue team member, and gain access to the blue team area. And it was so, it was like so easy. Yes. I was like, it's not even like. It's like stealing candy from a baby. I think cheating and hacking are, are interchangeable similar. terms. Yeah. At so the, at so that to give point. you an idea, I was literally taking a crap when I saw this from the guys. That's and way too much information. And I, and I was reading through it just, so you know. on, my, on my phone. And uh, we posted some of the commands that were interesting. Uh, git config. I think it's really a deterrent for people to steal your, your phone. phone. Yeah. So git config you dash global user dot email. Subar Ahmed at Echofax.com. Shortly <laughs> there later, LDAP search to such and such Echofax.com. Blah, 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 blah. Dash W and a hash. Later, Ansible Ops Manager dash I host dash M shell dash A echo dash E password enter password pipe to password dash dash standard in for root changing root password via Ansible Ops Manager. Nice. So I'm um, uh... <laughs> and even better, the command was fucked up because the two passwords didn't match. Galen Oops. called that out. Working uh, <laughs> with Ansible, I think one of the things that I've gleaned is if you don't pay attention to authentication, it can be a really bad scene. Mm -hmm. Like, really bad. Yeah, but the fact that from the command line, uh, that was what I was looking for. I was like, where are the passwords mistyped and so forth? And no, this was properly typed, except for the fact that the passwords didn't match because idiot. Uh, the fact that they were changing the password via a command line to pipe various stuff uh, to and it's... and this is how you get owned. And I think one of the things that came out of that conversation we had at work was, I think someone needs to develop an OPSEC for GitHub users. Well, mm. it kind of goes back to Adobe uh, leaking <coughs> their private yes. PGP key. Uh we see that, which, by the way, nice was invalidated segue again. Which was invalidated fairly quickly. It was, but still, uh, still, it was the PGP key to their P cert, which is uh, the bad. Public, the public one. Um, we had uh, Jeff. You wanted to talk about uh, society becoming desensitized to the loss of personal data. Which may be a, a, a segue from... Uh, is that based uh, on the uh, uh, to, SEC to, breach, uh, or, or to Jeff? Late, to late well, it's, it's based... Well, the, the particular article I posted is based on Equifax, the SA, SEC, and Deloitte. And, wait, wait, wait. And uh, the you have to, you have to well, say the article is yeah. really short, and it's basically, hey, what do you all think? You know, are, are people getting desensitized because yes. all of these big breaches? I would argue that and they're they're asking about the consumers. I'm like, I would argue that consumers aren't really aware of this mm -hmm. a whole lot to begin mm -hmm. with. Yep. yep. So I, I think the premise is even flawed. Yep. But and I think it's a fair question to ask maybe within our community when so many bad breaches are being announced and, and they seem to be coming in waves. And in the last couple of weeks, it's been Equifax it's been the SEC and See? it's been Deloitte. And we yep. could probably spend some time talking about each one of those and probably spend mm -hmm. a segment. But Maybe you know, next week. As a security professional, yep. I get to the point where I'm like, oh, why do we even bother? You know, when do you just kind of give up? Can can we refer to Deloitte and Touche by their their humor name? No, uh, you're, you're if you, if you're, you want to go you, there, you no. switch the first and second. Well, no, yeah. no, <laughs> I know where you're going with this, Larry. <laughs> to light, to light <laughs> We've what? been doing the show long enough. I know exactly where you're going. <laughs> we're not going to go there because we're professionals. We're we're closer to adults now. Yes, and than we before. and we probably know folks that work. We're at still pretty far Deloitte. away from being adults, but we're closer well, than we were before. I'll, I'll say <laughs> this: I, I was in the consulting world for a long time, working for startup consulting uh -huh. companies, working for not the big four, and 
And, you know, they were always entrenched. They mm-hmm. were the companies, and I'm not picking on Deloitte specifically, but, you know, the big four accounting firm. it used to be big five, it used to be big six accounting firms. They were the ones that were always entrenched in the customers because they were doing the financial stuff. They would have people that would have names on their doors. You know, they were that permanently entrenched. And we were always competing against them as consultants and didn't think much of them. We, we called them... Uh, IROX, idiots right out of college. You know, they would Oof. advertise, oh, we're the greatest, we're the best. But then they would bring in junior people that knew how to ask the question and check the box. Mm-hmm. I mean, so I have strong opinions about uh, Deloitte and the big four just from a from a sort of a competitive perspective as a consultant, not even getting into the, do they even understand cyber mm-hmm. insecurity and the tech technical side of things right so like i said we could spend a whole segment on that yep jeff but, i i want to and i want to let's give you a button i want to comment real quick sure no go ahead no so i thinking about that is that the folks that are in these places that have been compromised uh that are on their security teams um you're going to look at their resumes a year from now when they're looking for a new job and you're going to say oh man you were at deloitte or you were at Equifax when they got compromised, they were probably mm-hmm. there fighting the good fight and not getting the support yep. that they needed. And you, you hope. You, I, I would argue that those are folks that I want to take a second look at because mm-hmm. they were the guys that were in the shit when the shit went down. And they sure. know some of the worst of the worst and what challenges that organizations face from a business perspective, either from the blue side or from the red side. And I would very much consider, for me as a hiring manager, I would very much ask to them to throw a second hat in the ring or a hat in the ring for a position I was hiring, specifically because I knew they were in the shit when the shit was happening. Yes and no. I mean, you're whether whether they stack up or not. That's a different story. But because I knew they were there, I would I, I would certainly I, ask. I just want I, I hear what you're saying, and I I, I agree with it to the mm-hmm. extent that if somebody's lived through it, I mean, I, I've worked for a lot of companies post very public breach. Mm. Um, I, I I've not been involved with companies that all of a sudden discovered the breach but i've certainly been involved numerous times with the with the fallout and the cleanup and the and the um uh the management changes and transitions that go on um you know like for the equifax thing there's been a lot of and i try and i try to ignore most of it but i know that there's been issues with you know they fired the CISO and they fired i think the cio and finally now they the ceo has resigned as of a couple of days ago which in my opinion should have been the first move you you fire the head coach you don't fire the the equipment managers and the in the and the assistant coaches but um, you know, with with all the stuff that's going on, I I I, I get fatigued. Why do we bother? You know, mm-hmm. you know, we we the security professionals. You know, we're up against the realities of you know companies, and these are enterprise companies that everybody focuses on. They have budget. They buy a bunch of stuff, and they fundamentally are missing the point they're they're missing something and and i want to try to get through to the you know can we just try to talk about what you're you know what you're missing here because you're clearly missing something but that seems to get lost in all of the marketing and sales and reporting and media hype about you know the the CISO was a, a music major and and you know wh- why were they even no, qualified that, uh, so here, and, and on and on and on no it's it, so here's my take on that I think that anytime you have a major breach that the organization is going to get rid of those top level management positions as a PR move. In other yep. words, we're replacing our top level managers because well, it doesn't they matter whether they were doing a good job or not. Right. Their background is like so irrelevant to the conversation yep. that it's not even worth yeah. talking think, about. Think, yeah, think about how many folks in our industry that you've talked to that their background is not in It's ridiculous, cyber. right? Like, basically, Equifax is like, well, for a PR move, hey, we're going to fire the CFO, we're going to fire the CISO, and we're going to fire the CEO. We're going to replace those right. with new people, mm-hmm. and right. that's just that a PR all move. Have music degrees. But I yep. do hope that in my take on the Equifax breach, and if anyone has 
comments on this, I'm more than willing yeah. to hear them. But my take is that when you look at everything that happened with the Equifax breach, my take is that they had no security culture. They had not built yep. a security yep. culture into the organization. Mm -hmm. So to kind of back up really like not so much a PR move, but you get rid of your top level positions, you replace those. I hope security that if you're culture. going to continue right as a security, as an organization, that security is going to be part of your culture. You hire people, they're going to help build a security culture. Right. To me, and you can pick on vulnerabilities, you can pick on people. I think that's wrong. I think you need to pick on the fact that Equifax hasn't built a security culture. And, and, the fact and that, I like, will, I will also argue that maybe they had a security culture. Their security culture wasn't mature. It was wrong. Like or it was just it was not mature. effective well, yeah. at all. The yeah, fact the, that you well, would let a vulnerability, whatever it is, whatever you would postulate what it was, uh -huh. right? The fact that you would let that fester for a while but, well, and for a couple a couple of months that could affect millions of dollars and, and I heard all customers. kinds of stories like it was like it. default guys, passwords guys, I had pace bins mm -hmm. that was default passwords that was this and the you need to build a security culture, culture. in your organization yep. it was very it was clear to me in at least reading what was published in the press they had not done that hopefully that they can do that moving forward mm -hmm. now also the kind of other flip side of it is well it doesn't matter even if the people that were in position had some security culture that they were trying to build. Mm -hmm. They're just going to get rid of those people as a PR move to save the company. Yep. And that's probably why Equifax will continue as a company because they're like, hey, we got rid of everyone, we're replacing with new people, and we're going to be more secure. And I, I tell you what, I, I think that we've seen over history the big companies, the Home Depot, the Targets of the world, mm -hmm. that have had those big breaches, they're secure today because they've right. had that big breach and they've built that into the – remember TJX back in the day? Yep. Like they've had that big breach, Sony, whatever yep. you want to yep. use as your use case, they've had that big breach – they replaced that security people mm -hmm. or others in the high level organization. They built that security culture and they're going to move on to it today. I want to move on. But just Paul, to, Paul, Go ahead, Jeff. One no, more point. No, we're not going to move on. Um, I got a couple more points. Uh, I agree sort of with what you're saying, but you know, this gets to the heart of me as a, as a, as an old timer security professional and sort of the desensitization, you know, having, having seen this and having lived through it and having had customers have gone through this so many times, um, what you're saying is true. And I absolutely, uh, you know, uh, echo the idea that there needs to be culture, but the reality is, and this is something that's hard for me as a security professional to get my head around and try to come up with a solution. The culture is, uh, economic based at the end of the day you know you would like to think I, I i never did business with equifax i had customers that were their competitors i won't say who so i'm sort of familiar with that that industry you'd like to think that it's heavily regulated because they touch in financial services they probably had some regulatory compliance things that they had to answer to and you know if you just boil down to the fact that they had a uh, they had a vulnerability that was disclosed that was unpatched and they had some sort of reason that they didn't patch it and it and it and it extended beyond what most compliance standards say is when you need to have it patched there was something fundamentally wrong there i agree with you that it was culture but it was also uh if you think that they had some sort of um functional security program in place somebody made a risk based decision saying we're going to let this we're going to let this you know go you know we there's there's reasons why we can't fix this immediate problem i talked to people at DerbyCon, you know there was all you know little rumors and stuff that were saying that you know perhaps the experian knew that they had been breached even sooner than what's been disclosed publicly I don't care. You know, the fact that they had issues because they're a target and they're a public company and they didn't have a fundamental fundamental way of fixing it is a problem. It's a cultural problem. But let's say Equifax 
was doing the right things. They had the culture. They were doing everything. The reality is you still get breached. You can still get breached. That's sort of the 800-pound gorilla in this industry. You can do all the right things, spend millions and billions of dollars and all the security tools and have trained people, and you can still get breached. And then you have to go through this whole PR media, you know, going through the the gauntlet of, uh, you know, you're stupid. Oh, all these things went wrong and all the fingers start getting pointed in all different ways. Someday we have to, we as an industry have to cope with the fact that you can do all the right things and you can still get breached in an egregious way. And how are we going to deal this, deal with this as an industry from a PR perspective, from a from a customer perspective, from a public perspective of how do we spin this thing. I'm not saying that's where we were with Experian. I do give props to Experian, even though they delayed their disclosure. At least they figured it out within a couple months where the industry averages, what, still like a you know close to a year for detecting the breach. I, I, I'm looking forward to hearing more of the details of what went wrong and and I feel like Experian is going to be the poster child for for months, if not years, to come in terms of lessons learned and and how you need to, you know, how you need to do security right. But unfortunately, the flip side is that they're going to be the 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 fud that all the security vendors and the product vendors and everybody that's trying to sell the latest greatest. If you use us, all your problems are solved. That's my frustration. Yeah, but when you talk about what. Like, what's the right thing to do versus the business aspect of it? I -hmm. think that doing the right thing could have saved them money down the line. Yep. You know what I mean? I agree. Hindsight being 2020, right? Yeah, like like being able to uh, patch and or remediate the vulnerabilities is the right thing to do. I think that if they had made that decision earlier on, they could have got ahead of it. And not suffered, whether they uh, flourish as a company or not, they've suffered a huge, um, I think, reputational damage that is difficult to measure that I think is is, doing the right thing is probably a cost them less than what it costs to preserve their reputational damage and continue on as a company. I think it's a poster child for larger organizations that have that level of information that protecting it is of less cost than it is to losing it Mm -hmm. and then fighting that fight after the fact. Yeah. I agree with that, but it's still 2020 hindsight because to what degree that they screwed the pooch on the decision that they made, they made a risk-based decision. They were aware of the vulnerability and for for whatever reason, and, you know, I'll talk to the current pen testers, but in my experience, when I used to pen test, the the common argument was we can't patch because it breaks something. You know, there's some business reason why we can't do it. I don't, I'm not saying that's what the issue was, but that would be my yeah, likely but I, suspect. You know, I, so I, and I've been in the trenches in this exact same situation. And we I all have. Yeah, but I don't right? think it's, a, it's not so much a business decision as it is a development decision. And I think that's a hard lesson learned by a major organization that hasn't adapted to the new development methods that are available today. In that I understand there are huge complications in updating your application server. For example, I think that larger organizations of this caliber need to latch on to the newer development methods that allow them to update to get ahead of the problem. I won't make any insane analogies in this, in this light, right? But oh, come on now. But uh, so, you, and people make analogies to healthcare or car maintenance or house maintenance or whatever it might be, right? But getting ahead of the problem is certainly within the capabilities of modern organizations today. But they re, they they don't do that because they can feel safe in doing what they do today. Uh, I think the, well, the so the best analogy the I'll make, as insane as it sounds, is that when you live in a neighborhood where all the homes are built around the same time, you see your neighbors with your their hot water heaters that have failed on the curbside and 
also all of their furniture and infrastructure and, and carpeting and, and whatever know. else in their basement you know. on the curbside because their hot water heater broke. The smarter households will go ahead and replace that hot water heater mm -hmm. before it breaks. I think that's the best analogy that I can think of to say, well, hey, we see – use Equifax as your neighbor who had their hot water heater break, didn't have the monitoring detection or patching mechanisms in place to be able to detect that. They suffered the consequences. You need to look at that and say, I need to replace my hot water heater before it busts out, before there's a problem. Yep. It's not no, – no, no, the analogy, analogy breaks down because – but, it, but the analogy breaks down because it's not as easy as just like replacing one device. The organizations mm -hmm. looking at Equifax need to change their entire software development life cycle to be able to get ahead of that problem. Yep. It's a much harder and, problem and to it, solve. And the larger organization, the harder it gets. Yeah, exactly. Because it's not just like one device that doesn't have a lot of dependencies you need to replace. It's – one piece of software, or that, that is an impact. hundreds of people's uh, piece of software that need to and that impact a massive business process. Right. No, that, that's a very interesting analogy that you use, Paul. But you know, how many of your neighbors, you know, see the infrastructure failure of their neighbors, and because of fiscal constraints, they're like, ah, I know I should do it, but I'm I'm just going to wait until no. It you're happens. right, Jeff. No, you're right. No, that's, it, the economics do, do play in in that scenario as well, and in yep. it, it it it's a bad analogy because the fiscal constraints we're talking about. You know, hundreds of dollars and not a whole lot of process, right? Like, mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot of process that goes into maintaining and operating my hot water. Like, it just, my hot water heater freaking works, right? Like, there's no, there's not a team of developers that's supporting my hot water heater at my house. In an organization, there's teams of developers that are supporting potentially hundreds of hot water heaters across the organization. Mm -hmm. They could need to adapt to a new method to replace those before they break. So, uh, again, that's why I kind of preface that with, like, there's not really a good analogy I can come with on the fly that speaks to that issue. However, I think it should be a red flag to a lot of enterprises that do have those legacy, for lack of a better example, hot water heaters that they know are going to fail. And to get ahead of that environment, to have the necessary development processes, architecture, and security in software processes to get ahead of that problem to make sure that doesn't happen. That's not easy, but I think that it's a good talking point in terms of Equifax to make sure that yeah. we highlight that as an example to say you need to rethink your whole process. Well, and, and, the, and the fatigue is, I swear, I got out of pen testing exactly because I had a customer that after two or three pen tests and we found the same same issues that got us in and got us total, right. you know, mm. access. Uh, and and their claim was, well, we can't change it because it's going to break the app, or you know, we're we're using some sort of software that's under license, and we've talked to the vendor, and right. and and they're not, you know, they're unresponsive. They're they're working on it, you know, you know, whatever the excuse was. I mean, that's where the frustration for me got to the point was there's got to be there's there's got to be a different way to get through this. Mm. Um, so while I agree with you. Uh, I still think it's somewhat idealistic, let's say, to expect that that's what's going to happen. I, I think f I think these hard discussions need to happen about, you know, if you're a company and you you know you think you're tied to this, you know, these are the bad things that can happen. Point to Equifax and say this could happen <laughs> to you, and somehow make it other than you know some get beyond the fud element right. to say no, this is you. And and it's only yeah. the you know the luck of the draw that this hasn't happened to you yet. And unfortunately, there's too many companies, organizations, enterprises out there that are ex in exactly the same boat. It's not that they're doing things right. It's that the the casual hacker hasn't found that one thing that actually compromises them yet. Yeah, but and, but I think that's a great point, Jeff. Is that there are active attackers looking to exploit these exposures in your network. And yep. that's different from maintaining architecture. In other words, if I point to the thing next to my hot water heater in my house, which is my furnace, mm -hmm. 
Right. I don't necessarily run through this. I mean, I do because I'm a security professional, but most people don't run through. There's an external attacker that wants to cause a failure or exploit some exposure in my furnace. Mm -hmm. However, the condensation pump for my furnace, I'm going to keep a spare because I know that if that component fails, I'm not doing heater or cooling without that condensation pump. And... I don't know if there's good analogies into security for that because of the external, as Jeff yep. and others have pointed out, like there's an external attacker looking to cause those things to fail in a way that benefits them. In my home, I I, I did. I had a, a condensation uh, pump, and I'm like, I know that's going to fail. I know that other people in my neighborhood, that has failed. So guess what? Let's get a new one. I bought one from Amazon. I kept it in my home. In one day, last summer and the summer of before, that condensation pump failed. And guess what I did? Swap I went in. Larry, I Larry cut my old one out. I slapped my new one in. And in under an hour, I left for work. And I was told my wife and children, you're good. You can run the air conditioner. Everything's fine. Prepper mantra. Larry, it's a, two it's is one. Paul on the back. One is it's none. A, Pat him on the back. It's a prepper thing. Yep. But I didn't have to worry about... The well, I wasn't considering the external attacker that was f- like banking on that vulnerability in my furnace, mm-hmm. so that I had to keep a backup to to keep operations running. So the the the, the uh, parallels in the uh, examples kind of fall down well, in that so respect. So I, I would argue that the external attacker is potentially the weather. Yeah, and you that you over you overdrove it. It. Went cra- crazy. I could, I could probably give it. a whole. Yeah, I give a whole talk about kung fu movies and security. I could probably give a whole talk about home like, repair. What I, what, everything I learned it, to know it, about security, I learned from home repair. I learned from a, the, a Christmas story. That's I'll shoot your eye out. I'll shoot your eye. You like shoot your the eye the, out. the yeah. dad that's always like cursing the furnace, furnace and the base. Yep. Like that was me. Like everything that could have gone wrong with my furnace. Did. Like has gone wrong so much so that I built in multiple safeguards up to that point where I'm like, you know what? I know that that's going to fail. And you know what? I'm going to have a spare on hand and I'm just going to swap everything it out. I, everything I learned about Blue Team, I learned from home Defending my furnace. Home maintenance. Right? Like, is, your, yeah. is your furnace built to a standard? Are you using the latest version? Are you updating the software on, uh, on the well, furnace? Well, that's the whole thing. And, like, and, the and, board, and, and, like and, I would love the, the board on my are, furnace. Are you that, relying on compensating controls? And like, we can processes. totally segue into, like, IoT. Huh? I would love to have so many an IoT device on my furnace that told me like gave me some reporting on the operations of my furnace while that would expose vulnerabilities that we talked about with the IoT. Mm-hmm. It would also give me some information that could le- allow me to make risk-based it's, it's, decisions it's, it's about like, what I would keep it's like, on. It's like the elevator repairman. Oh, sorry, your elevator called and says it needs maintenance. Yeah. <laughs> like your furnace called, it basically says your are bl- You, you got you to clean the damn nozzles. God damn it. I've had every freaking problem with Larry, the, I think the it's blower more like the fan. Guy that's, you know, you're changing the light bulb and you're on your uh, turn <sighs> signal in your car and you ask your buddy to go out and t- let you know if it's working. And he goes, yep. it's working. It's not working. It's working. It's I mean, working. The, like the blower <laughs> fan, fan is gone. The circulator fan, mm-hmm. like the, every part you could possibly imagine. Uh, but you haven't had this one. And you helped me fix this one. At one point, well, you helped me fix this one. Capacitor on my air conditioner. You, you haven't had your boiler fill up I've with water. <laughs> I have. I have. Because one of the pipes sagged and water was going back into it and, and filling up. I I've, had two, I've had that problem. I had two feet of water in the basement. I haven't can, had can that I, That's problem. a different story. Mm-hmm. Can, I, can I make a suggest, suggestion? Just yes. Yeah, what do you oh. recommend for home maintenance, Joff? Because <laughs> we, we got to end this. I got to go that's home. Yeah. We, we, we got to go. <laughs> We're way over time. Joff, go. We're way off. Home, home maintenance weekly. Go ahead. It's the next podcast. All right. You ready? Yes. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Over <laughs> and out. Larry, give us another over and out. No, no. Joff did it. <laughs> Joff did it. Yeah, everyone all together. One, two, three. Over, Over and, and out. out. out.